Asimov's Science Fiction, July 2008. Copyright 2008 by Dell Magazines. Read by Michael Scherer. This magazine contains 144 pages. Approximate reading time, 7 hours 40 minutes. This magazine contains markers allowing direct access to the contents and articles at level 1 and to the sections at level 2. This recorded edition contains the entire text of the print edition, except for advertising. This magazine was produced for the National Library Service for the Blind and Physically Handicapped, Library of Congress. Table of Contents Departments Editorial Two robots and an alien walk into a bar. Sheila Williams. Page 4. Six minutes. Reflections. Rereading Stapledon 2. Robert Silverberg. Page 8. Eleven minutes. In Memoriam. Janet Kagan. Page 11. Two minutes. Letters. Page 12. Nine minutes. Thought Experiments. When the Whole World Looked Up, Christine Catherine Rush, page 16, 14 minutes. Novelettes, Lester Young and the Jupiter's Moon's Blues, Gord Seller, page 20, 86 minutes. Short Stories, The Woman Under the World, Stephen Utley, page 47, 18 minutes. Cascading Violet Hair, R. Neuba, page 52, 37 minutes. Novelettes, Vinegar Peace, or The Wrong Way Used Adult Orphanage, Michael Bishop, page 64, 56 minutes. Short Stories, 26 Monkeys, also The Abyss, Kidge Johnson, page 81, 26 minutes. Novella, The Philosopher's Stone, Brian Stableford, page 90, 149 minutes. Poetry, Light Across an Impossible Lake, Mark Rich, page 135, 2 minutes. Departments, On Books, Paul De Filippo, page 136, 24 minutes. The SF Conventional Calendar, Erwin S. Strauss, page 142, 9 minutes. Next Issue, page 144, 3 minutes. Editorial, by Sheila Williams, reading time, 6 minutes. Two Robots and an Alien Walk into a Bar Coming upon a genuinely funny tale is both a happy and, alas, far too rare occasion. Writers seem considerably more drawn to the dark side of fiction than they are to the light-hearted. I am sometimes criticized for running issues too dominated by serious and weighty stories. I'm always on the lookout for humor, though, and buy as much of it as I can. I enjoy funny stories, and I usually find that readers respond quite positively to them as well. There are many explanations for why the amount of humorous fiction available doesn't meet the demand for it. It could be that I'm seeing a lot more funny stories than I realize, but I just don't get the joke. I certainly see stories that people tell me are funny, but which don't work for me. Funny stories can be very hard to do well. In addition to everything else that a regular story needs, strong characterization, fresh ideas, and skillful plotting, a funny tale has to include a sense of timing, possibly a sense of the ridiculous, and certainly insight into what makes people laugh. A Portrait of the Artist, February 2007, Charles Midwinter's Tale of an Artist and Some Sentient Squirrels, is one very successful example of this sort of story. Not one detail is wasted in this little gem. It's a story that I'd love to see staged as a play. It was also a first sale, and it led me to the surprising insight that I seem to encounter more amusing stories from writers who are new, or relatively new to me, than from the writers I am most familiar with. Other recent examples of newer writers penning funny tales for us include Felicity Shoulders and Tim McDaniel. Of course, humor is not completely dominated by new writers. Neil Barrett Jr., author of The Amazing Ginny Sweethips Flying Circus, February 1988, and more recently Slyden, April-May 2008, 
and radio station St. Jack, which will be appearing in our August issue, is a true poet of the absurd who can make us laugh until we cry about the apocalypse and its aftermath. I have great admiration for authors such as Rudy Rucker and Charles Strauss who can make wise cracks and fashion outrageous scenes while explaining the finer points of the singularity or higher mathematics. The aforementioned stories represent some of the many kinds of humorous tales. There are the stories that are funny all the way through, stories that are sublimely ridiculous, tales that may be deadly serious except for moments of hilarity, and stories that are inside jokes. Michael Swanwick is the master of the inside joke. His letters to the editor, October-November 2001, and Congratulations from the Future, July 2007, could only have appeared in Asimov's. Stories like those run the risk of being dismissed by the untutored reader. Fortunately for us, at least 95% of you were in on the jokes, and the other 5% came up to speed pretty quickly. Naturally, of course, humor stories run multiple risks. There is the concern that the reader won't get the joke. There is also the possibility that the reader will get the joke, but won't consider it funny. Often it's the humorous stories that come under the most sustained attacks from critics. Critics of short, funny stories often seem to be arguing with the straw man version of the story. They will go after a serious point that they believe the author made or failed to make. Much of the time these criticisms would be legitimate if the tale had been a serious one. But in the case of the funny story, the serious point may have nothing to do with what the story is really about. It's tempting but unfair to dismiss the critic as lacking a sense of humor. More likely, the writer has failed to get the joke across to widest possible audience, or else the critic's sense of what is funny is just narrower than it might otherwise be. What makes my job easier, though, is that it's usually those same stories that reap praise from the rest of you. One other disadvantage for the authors of funny fiction is that their skillful work may fail to get serious attention. Yes, there are exceptions, like Connie Willis and Howard Waldrop, who are capable of getting their amusing work onto the final ballots for Hugo and Nebula Awards. Still, most award finalists seem to have a lot more in common with Connie's heartbreaking The Last of the Winnebago's, July 1988, than they do with her comic Even the Queen, April 1992. Esther M. Friesner, who has delighted us with numerous witty stories, won both her Nebula Awards with dark and disturbing pieces. One type of story I'd like to see a lot more of is the kind that can mix the transformative and the earth-shattering with the droll and the hilarious. Like a good Irish wake, the end of the world can be easier to take when served with a dollop of humor. I'm not the only one who likes these tales. Stories that can leaven highly stressful situations with some humor are very popular and often receive critical attention as well. This sort of fiction has a very good shot at bringing home the gold. So authors, please keep this advice in mind the next time you set that doomsday device on a course heading for planet Earth. We welcome your letters. They should be sent to Asimov's, 475 Park Avenue South, Floor 11, New York, New York, 10016, or emailed to Asimov's at dellmagazines.com. Space and time make it impossible to print or answer all letters, but please include your mailing address, even if you use email. If you don't want your address printed, put it only in the heading of your letter. If you do want it printed, please put your address under your signature. We reserve the right to shorten and copy edit letters. Reflections by Robert Silverberg Reading Time, 11 Minutes Rereading Stapledon 2 A couple of months ago I chose Odd John, Olaf Stapledon's tale of a superhuman genius, for the fourth in this series of re-readings of classic science fiction novels. Taking a new look at Odd John got me interested in investigating Last and First Men, the British philosopher's most famous book, which such people as Arthur C. Clarke and Stanislav Lem regard as the greatest of all visions of the far future. More than fifty years had gone by since my last reading of it. I had found it overwhelming then. Would it have the same power for me now? What is immediately apparent is that Stapledon, who lived from 1886 to 1950, may have been a great visionary, but he wasn't much of a prophet. Writing in 1930, he completely failed to foresee the rise of Adolf Hitler just three years later, 
and spoke of the Germany of his day as the most pacific of nations, a stronghold of enlightenment. Instead, he singled out Mussolini, who was already in, and the historical records of that era are stored on metal plates constructed of an immensely durable artificial element, a Gernsbachian construction that no modern SF writer would have used. He speaks of ingenious methods for solving a problem and a certain marine salt as a cause of infant mortality, but doesn't specify. Such vagueness recurs many times, but these flaws don't matter. The book is a breathtaking vision, one of the greatest works of science fiction ever written. And, after a dark epilogue that seems to foreshadow the terrible war only nine years in Stapleton's future, comes up marvelous epilogue to the epilogue, with the dazzlingly endowed 18th men at the brink of extinction, summing up humanity's two billion years of cyclical striving. Man himself, at the very least, is music, a brave theme that makes music also of its vast accompaniment, its matrix of storms and stars. Man himself, in his degree, is eternally a beauty in the eternal form of things. It is very good to have been man. And so we may go forward together with laughter in our hearts, and peace, thankful for the past, and for our own courage. For we shall make, after all, a fair conclusion to this brief music that is man. In Memoriam, Janet Kagan, 1946-2008 to Reading Time, Two Minutes Janet Kagan, who died on February 29, 2008, of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, was an author whose work was immensely popular with the readers of Asimov's. From 1989 to 1992, she practically owned the annual Reader's Award novelette category. Her first Mama Jason story, The Loch Moose Monster, March 1989, about the plucky settlers on the planet Mirabala and their adventures and misadventures, with the genetic chimere hidden in their daffodils and otters, came in first, while her next tale, The Return of the Kangaroo Rex, October 1989, came in second. The following year, Getting the Bugs Out, November 1990, won the award, while The Flowering Inferno, March 1990, came in third. A year later, her last two Mama Jason stories, Raising Cain, March 1991, and Franken's Wine, August 1991, took second and third place. In 1992, these wonderful stories were knitted together and published by Tor Books as the highly regarded novel Mirabile. In addition to winning Janet her last Reader's Award, her 1992 non-Mirabile story, The Nutcracker Coup, December, was a finalist for the Nebula Award and the winner of the Hugo Award. Janet's work was the inspiration for my young adult anthology The Loch Moose Monster, more stories from Isaac Asimov's science fiction magazine, Delacorte Press, 1993, and I was grateful to her for allowing me to borrow the name of her story for the title of the book. Janet was well able to combine warmth and humor with dramatic plotting. We hadn't seen anything new from her for many years, but the legacy that she left in the pages of Asimov's will last for a very long time. Sheila Williams Letters Reading time, nine minutes. Dear Editor, I just read a back issue of your magazine that I'd overlooked for some reason or other, and wanted to send in some reader comments. The issue was the February 2007 one, and the story that got me to write in was called A Portrait of the Artist, by Charles Midwinter. I loved this story. The author does a nice job of leaving enough up for grabs, while grounding everything in some pretty good character interaction. The turnarounds at the end are solid, and the plotting in general is short story gold. This is precisely the type of stuff I want to read when I sit down with a short story mag. Please try to get some more material from him. You already may have, and I just haven't gotten there yet, but keep up the pressure all the same. Thanks for a great read. Al Wilson Dear Editor, I just finished the September issue of Asimov's and feel that I have to write. How Music Begins was a compelling story, probably made even more so by my personal experience in both playing in a concert band in junior high and high school, and my much later completion of a bachelor's in music. I originally went for a degree in music education, but had to change to jazz studies when I lost my sight. It doesn't seem wise to try to lead a room full of young adults with thousands of dollars worth of musical instruments if you can't see them. The story was enticing and well-written. 
However, it left me wanting more. I want to now hear the story from Elise's point of view, perhaps with the mystery explained at the end. Many reasons spring to mind as to why the band was abducted, and I'm sure the author probably has yet another I haven't thought of. It's stories like this that inspire me to work harder on my own writing. On the other hand, the story What Wolves Know was an interesting tale, but I seem to have missed the science fictional or fantastic aspect of the tale. I'm not sure why it was in the magazine. I kept waiting throughout the story for it, but it never materialized. Nicole Massey, Arlington, Texas Dear Editors, Greg Egan's story, Dark Integers, in the October-November 2007 issue is well written and entertaining, but... Many SF and fantasy stories require a suspension of disbelief, but this story requires one that I just cannot make. I cannot make myself think that mathematics follows in some way from the behavior of the real world, or that altering mathematics can change the real world. It is just too strongly ingrained in me that mathematics is entirely the work of man, totally disconnected from the real world. Sure, it's useful for understanding and analyzing the real world, but that does not mean that one governs the other. No one is watching propositions as if they were real objects to see what axioms they obey. What does obey mean in a mathematical context anyway? In fact, Egan mixes the abstract and the concrete to such an extent that at times his prose descends into meaningless gibberish. Send a plume of alternative mathematics back across the border? Wiggling the border between the two systems back and forth to encode each transmitted bit? Come on! And all this without getting specific enough to get a handle on anything. Just what cluster of propositions behave differently? In what way do dark integers play by different rules? All this is not to say that I didn't enjoy the story. It's just that reading it made me feel like I was walking on quicksand. I prefer stories based on solid ground. Bruce M. Foreman, Chambersburg, Pennsylvania. Dear Miss Williams, I've read and reread Chris Butler's short story, The Turn, October November 2007. The story's details seem deliberately to suggest real world reference, but I've failed to discover the grand analogy. I don't mind being disappointed with myself as long as I eventually receive a lin, Thunder Bay, Ontario. Dear Ms. Williams, Having read your editorial, My Rowboat, in the February issue, I thought you might enjoy hearing about a much earlier use of the rowboat pun. A short story titled The Astounding Dr. Asimov by R. F. DeBown, analog January 1974, centers on a prominent science fiction writer and scientist and Shakespeare biographer who secretly owes his prodigious output to the fact that he has made five clones of himself. Anyway, the story tells us that among his most famous works is the classic I, Rowboat, which is described, here I quote from 34-year-old memory, as the tragic tale of an intelligent dinghy making its way in a hostile world. Gary W. Lucas, Salem, Connecticut Thought Experiments Christine Catherine Rush Reading Time, 14 Minutes When the Whole World Looked Up The ever-popular Christine Catherine Rush looks at an era when it seemed that the whole world was enchanted with the promise of space travel. We are all in the gutter, but some of us are looking at the stars. Oscar Wilde I figured out what inspired me to write science fiction on a dark and lonely afternoon in the New Haven Public Library. I was in Connecticut to research a mystery novel set in 1969, eventually published as the award-nominated War at Home under my pen name Chris Nelscott. I was going through microfiche of the New Haven Register from July of 1969, and I found an article titled Science Fiction A Jump Ahead, Space Journeys Already Forgotten. The article had come through the Associated Press, and it was a glowing account of how science fiction had predicted space travel long before the Apollo program started. The article starts like this. To the science fiction writers who predicted it in the first place, the upcoming moon flight of Apollo 11 is old hat. I'm sure it wasn't. I'm sure the SF writers quoted in the article, from Isaac Asimov to Arthur C. Clarke, 
were as excited and worried about the upcoming moon landing as the rest of us were. That they had predicted it didn't mean they weren't nervous about it. But none of that nervousness showed in the article. Instead, what the article dealt with in a very serious way was the then-current trends in science fiction. My former boss and editorial predecessor at the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, Edward L. Furman, was quoted as saying that stories with space travel as their central theme were getting harder and harder to find. John Campbell, the influential editor of Analog, said that modern science fiction ranges even beyond the soft sciences to explore concepts the sociologists wouldn't touch. The article is upbeat and interesting. I was so happy to see it that I spent the five cents to make a photocopy, and I've kept it on my desk ever since. But my story of inspiration doesn't stop there. My journey into 1969 was only beginning in New Haven. From there I went to New York City and spent hours in the Paley Center for Media, and there I watched a Charles Kuralt television special called The Day They Landed. Kuralt and his team spent July 20, 1969, traveling from first light on the East Coast to sundown in Hawaii. His goal for the show was to stop time for history, to show authors should blog. Striking writers in Hollywood are asking for a piece of the Internet downloads of television shows. An international space station orbits the Earth. The Chinese and Japanese have developed their own space programs. Russia is reviving its program. People in the private sector, most of them in their 40s and 50s, no surprise there, are experimenting with new vehicles to get humans into space. We live in a science fiction world. Not the world we imagined in 1969, but one in which I, a huge fan of the space program once upon a time, can't tell you the name of a single modern astronaut. When the news announces that the upcoming night will be so clear that we'll be able to see the shuttle, I sometimes forget to look. I'm used to shuttle launches and expanding computer power. I use satellites all the time. My favorite television programs reach me via satellite. The GPS in my phone tracks me from moment to moment, using a satellite. When I'm researching areas I haven't been to for a while, I go to websites that feature real-time satellite photos of the area and zoom in until I can see the license plates on the cars parked in the street. I have gotten used to the changes. I no longer marvel at things that would have caused my jaw to drop 15 years ago. Until I went to New Haven and saw that article on the Great Imaginers, the people who envisioned what this world would become, the SF writers whose bold vision had eventually made the moon landing possible, I had forgotten one of the grandest and most glorious aspects of science fiction. In one of the darkest times this country has ever known, science, and science fiction, gave us hope. It distracted us from the ugly events on the ground and made us look up. For a brief shining moment, it made us forget the gutter and dream of the stars. Lester Young and the Jupiter's Moon's Blues Gord Suller, Reading Time, 86 Minutes Gord Suller was born in Malawi, grew up in Nova Scotia and Saskatchewan, and has been living in South Korea since 2002. He has sold work to Nature, Flurb, Postcards from Hell, Fantasy, and Interzone. The author is also a jazz saxophonist, and although he hasn't played in a jazz group since 2002, he did play with a moderately successful Korean indie rock band from 2002 to 2004. The inspiration for his narrator Robbie's voice owes much to Miles Davis. He tells us, When I decided to write something about jazz, the voice and many distinctive expressions used by Davis in his autobiography and in interviews I'd seen just bubbled up from high school memories. In jazz, we often steal one another's riffs and rearrange them. That's old-school remixing, really. And in a sense, this is a fond and respectful tribute via remix of Miles Davis himself. Readers can learn more about the author at his website, g-o-r-d-s-e-l-l-a-r dot com. His first night back on Earth after his gig on the frog ships, Bird showed up at Minton's cleaner than a broke-dick dog, with a brand new horn and a head full of crazy people music. He'd got himself a nice suit somewhere, and a fine new con alto. Now, this was back in 48, when everyone, me included, was crazy about Con and King, and only a few younger cats were playing on summer horns. 
But it wasn't just that big-shouldered suit and the horn. The cat was clean. I mean clean. No more dope, no more liquor, no more fried chicken. Back. That was the first time ever where anything like that had been done, at least with the frogs. It was all new. It's easy to disrespect people making mistakes before you were born, way easier than worrying about not making your own mistakes. That's just bullshit, trying to fill us up with regret for what's all long gone now, like the frogs. Shit, maybe there are things I regret, like leaving Francine the way I did or how I totally stopped visiting J.J. in the asylum after we got back. But most of my regrets are for things that ain't my fault. I regret seeing Prez the way he ended up, for instance, and I regret never seeing Big C again, and Monique for that matter. I used to think about all that a lot, after I first got back. Man, I remember lots of times when I used to stand there under the bridge while everyone was playing back all their favorite lines from old records we all knew, and I'd look up into the sky and find Jupiter. It's easy, you know. Just look up. It looks like a star, a bright old star up there. I'd stare on up at Jupiter back then, and think of Prez, and blow a blues on my horn, the baddest old mother of a blues that anybody anywhere ever heard in the world. Visit our website, www.asimovs.com. Don't miss out on our lively forum, stimulating chats, controversial and informative articles, and classic stories. Log on today. The Woman Under the World Stephen Utley Reading Time, 18 Minutes Stephen Utley's Silurian Tales, launched in Asimov's in 1993, now number almost three dozen, and have also appeared or are about to appear in F and SF, Analog, the UK-based Postscripts, Sci Fiction, Revolution Science Fiction, the online edition of Cosmos Magazine, based Down Under, and Peter Crowther's We Think, Therefore We Are anthology, forthcoming from Daw Books. The author also has an anthology that he co-edited with Michael Bishop, Passing for Human, that has just come out from PS Publishing. The pod splits open with a hiss, and the glowing being steps out, looks about itself in confusion, takes it cannot say how long to understand what it is seeing, though it could not have said why what it sees is also puzzling. It finds itself at one end of a chamber hewn from solid rock and braced with timbers. Behind it, the pod lies against the wall like a smashed tomato. Ahead, at the angle of a bend, it makes out the shapes of a large television screen and a battery of monitoring devices, including a television camera mounted on a tripod. Behind this array is a metal door. As vision continues to improve, a man's face appears on the television screen. His mouth moves. The glowing being knows the man is speaking, but nothing can be heard. It wants and tries to say, What the hell's going on here? Where the hell am I? but cannot be certain that it succeeds in uttering even the most inarticulate sounds. No, wait, the man on the screen flinches. Response. So it has done something, not sure what, but something. The man looks off screen and shakes his head. Then another face, a woman's, crowds into view, and she too speaks soundlessly. The glowing being takes a step forward, and the expression on both faces on screen become a long college. Are people continuously themselves, or simply over and over again so fast that they give the illusion of continuous features, the temporal flicker of old silent film? Say fucking moi. You only think you were a person named Phyllis Lewis. You only think you have a body and organs. You only think you are, or at least were, human. But you are a ghost of a real human being. Not even a real ghost at that. And there is no PA system here, no TV cameras or monitors, no prison deep inside the earth. But part of me still wants to believe otherwise. It protests, how then do we communicate with... And then it catches itself up short. Of course. We don't communicate with anybody. There is no them with whom to communicate. It's just you and I, talking to ourselves, talking to myself existing for a timeless interval, but only as a side effect or byproduct of particle decay, 
and alone. 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 No, not quite. My husband and I waded into the cool water up to our knees, and he dipped his hand into the water, brushed his fingers across my face, and I was happy, excited by the prospect of going through the anomaly, but deeply satisfied to be standing knee-deep in water with my husband. And then I noticed tears in his eyes. Darling, darling, I asked, what is it? He almost sobbed. Whoever says time travel won't have its martyrs, just as space travel did. This anomaly business is so new and different and weird. Who knows what could happen? Nothing is going to happen to me, I said. I'm going to slip through and help set up a jump station on the other side. And then I'm coming right back, to you, to all this. Promise. I have, for as long as I do have it, for either a nanosecond or an eon, everything Phyllis Lewis has. I have my memories. Cascading Violet Hair Arnoiba Reading Time, 37 Minutes Arnoiba mixes love and plutonium in a hot tale about Cascading Violet Hair. The Sighting It was Thursday, so I walked home from work with Paul Lee. Come on, Henry, pick up the pace. It isn't aerobic until your heart breaks a sweat. My liver's dripping, isn't that enough? I asked. You have to change your flabby life. The barrel-chested man winked at a pedestrian as he pulled off his shirt. Paul strutted, basking as if the rush-hour crowd had turned out solely to worship his physique. It's not flab, but my strategic reserve for the next famine. There are a blowout at Lindgren's tonight. Why don't you join us? No thanks, I grumbled, trying to pretend I wasn't out of breath. Come on, Henry, you can't mourn forever. Get bent. My mind's eye watched my wife's body bag arcing toward Jupiter on its three-year flight to eternity. I successfully chilled memories of her scent. Ricky has a sister with a taste for older men. Paul jogged circles around me. I'll pass. A woman lifted her face. For a lingering heartbeat, her gray eyes tickled my blues. I froze. A statue honoring idiocy through the ages. Best! I leaned into the picture as Paul began yelling. I waved and unplugged the machine. She carried the pot of canal to the table where she attacked the alien veggie with a large wooden spoon. I went into the living room and played at my terminal. Shelling through the polistata onion, I cracked the revenuer's base. Shreds of canal dropped on my shoulder. There's a form of institutional judo you have to use on, dearie. You can't say your paycheck is in the wrong category unless you can show where the right category is. Sounds like you enjoy this paper chase. You have to take your pleasure where you find it, Mecca. More ham? Vinegar Peace, or The Wrong Way Used Adult Orphanage Michael Bishop, Reading Time, 56 Minutes Michael Bishop has published 17 novels in his career as a freelancer, including the Nebula Award-winning No Enemy But Time, 1982, Unicorn Mountain, winner of the Mythopoeic Fantasy Award, and Brittle Innings, 1994, an imaginative study of minor league baseball in the Deep South during World War II, and winner of the Locus Award for Best Fantasy Novel. He has written and published two mystery novels in collaboration with Paul De Filippo under the joint pseudonym Philip Lawson, Would It Kill You to Smile, 1998, and Muskrat Courage, 2000. He recently published a collection of essays, A Reverie for Mr. Ray, 2005, and recently edited the Thunder's Mouth Press anthology, A Cross of Centuries, 25 Imaginative Tales About the Christ, 2007. His latest book, Passing for Human, an anthology of stories about non-human creatures of various sorts, well, Passing for Human, which he and Stephen Utley co-edited for Peter Crowther's P.S. Publishing, will feature a haunting wraparound dust jacket by Michael's late son, Jamie Bishop. On Thursday evening, your doorbell rings. Two small men in off-white shirts and black trousers like missionaries of a dubious religious sect, 
stand outside your threshold, giving you scary, pitying looks. Are you Ms. K? they ask. When you assent, they say they've come to transport you to the Vinegar Peace Wrong Way Used Adult Orphanage, 30 minutes north of your current residence, in a life-help cottage of the Sour Thicket Sanatorium, where your father died seven years ago. But you don't wish to be transported anywhere. The smaller of the two small men, seizing your arm above the elbow, says that an order has come down that they must establish you, before 8.30 p.m., in a used adult orphanage, upon penalty of demotion for them and unappealable eviction for you. If you don't cooperate, they will ransack your cottage and throw you out on the street with your musty belongings. Why now, you ask? Neither stooge manifests a glimmer of humanity. After all, you've been an orphan, as they insist on terming your condition, since you were a vigorous fifty-nine. They should show some respect. The man holding your bicep smirks. That's why they call it a wrong way used adult orphanage, he says. You get into one not because you've lost a parent. Your last living child has to die. Messages. You return with your friend to the sleep bay without raising the subject again. But it makes sense, doesn't it? A decent orphanage adopts out its charges. If you believe, just believe, somewhere there's a compassionate Bryce or Elise, a person who survived six tours and wants nothing more than to rescue some poor wrong-way orphan from terminal warehousing. Such people do exist. They exist to lead you from vinegar peace to a place of unmerited milk and honey. That night, huddled on your cot amid the hubbub in the sleep bay, you envision a woman very like Elise sitting with you on a porch in late autumn or early winter. You sit shivering under scarlet lap robes, while this person whispers a soothing tale and tirelessly rubs your age-freckled hands. Twenty-six Monkeys also, The Abyss. Kidge Johnson. Reading time, 26 minutes. Kidge Johnson is a technical writer living in Seattle. She is an associate director and a member of the board of directors for the Center for the Study of Science Fiction based in Lawrence, Kansas, and a final juror for the Theodore H. Sturgeon Award. Her most recent project is a collection of nonfiction essays about rock climbing and bouldering, but she plans to get back to novels soon. Kidge owns a cat, who, she assures us, is not the least bit monkey-like. 1. Amy's big trick is that she makes 26 monkeys vanish on stage. 2. She pushes out a clawfoot bathtub and asks audience members to come up and inspect it. The people climb in and look underneath, touch the white enamel, run their hands along the little lion's feet. When they're done... Four chains are lowered from the stage's fly space. Amy secures them to holes drilled along the tub's lip and gives a signal, and the bathtub is hoisted ten feet into the air. She sets a stepladder next to it. She claps her hands, and the twenty-six monkeys on stage run up the ladder one after the other and jump into the bathtub. The bathtub shakes as each monkey thuds in among the others. The audience can see heads, legs, tails... But eventually, every monkey settles and the bathtub is still again. Zeb is always the last monkey up the ladder. As he climbs into the bathtub, he makes a humming boom deep in his chest. It fills the stage. And then there's a flash of light, two of the chains fall off, and the bathtub swings down to expose its interior. Empty. 3. They turn up later, back at the tour bus. There's a smallish dog door, and in the hours before morning the monkeys let themselves in, alone or in small groups, and get themselves glasses of water from the tap. If more than one returns at the same time, they murmur a bit among themselves, like college students meeting in the dorm halls after bar time. A few sleep on the sofa, and at least one likes to be on the bed, but most of them wander back to their cages. There's a little grunting as they rearrange their blankets and soft toys, and then sighs and snoring. Amy doesn't really sleep until she hears them all come in. Amy has no idea what happens to them in the bathtub, or where they go, or what they do before the soft click of the dog door opening. 
This bothers her a lot. 4. Amy. But she's already there. She just hadn't noticed. 22. Here's the trick to the bathtub trick. There is no trick. The monkeys pour across the stage and up the ladder and into the bathtub, and they settle in, and then they vanish. The world is full of strange things, things that make no sense, and maybe this is one of them. Maybe the monkeys choose not to share. That's cool. Who can blame them? Maybe this is the monkeys' mystery, how they found other monkeys that ask questions and try things, and figured out a way to all be together to share it. Maybe Amy and Jeff are really just house guests in the monkeys' world. They are there for a while, and then they leave. 23. Six weeks later, a man walks up to Amy as she and Jeff kiss after a show. He's short, pale, balding. He has the shell-shocked look of a man eaten hollow from the inside. She knows the look. I need to buy this, he says. Amy nods. I know you do. She sells it to him for a dollar. Three months later, Amy and Jeff get their first house guest in their apartment in Bellingham. They hear the refrigerator close and come out to the kitchen to find Pango pouring orange juice from a carton. They send her home with a pinochle deck. The Philosopher's Stone Brian Stableford Reading Time, 149 Minutes Although Brian Stableford has been very busy translating a series of classic French scientific romances for Black Coat Press, including books by Albert Robida, Félix Baudin, Gustave Le Rouge, and Charles de Rennes, he has managed to find the time to write the third novella concerning the alternate adventures of some famous 16th century personalities. In his latest tale, he explores the mysteries of The Philosopher's Stone. In The Plurality of Worlds, Asimov's August 2006, set in 1572 during the reign of Queen Jane, Thomas Diggs piloted an ether ship designed by John Dee into orbit around the Earth, in order to discover whether ether could sustain life as air did. In making that test, Diggs' body was invaded by a tenuous ethereal life form, which appointed itself as his guide when the ship was captured by the insectile inhabitants of the moon. Its crew, including Francis Drake, Walter Raleigh, John Field, and Edward de Vere, were subsequently sent by hyper-etheric transporter to the center of the galaxy, where they encountered the Molluscan Great Flesh Cores, rulers of a vast invertebrate empire. Diggs was informed by a rogue endoskeletal robot, however, that the empire was not as steady as the Flesh Cores claimed, and that humans would not be without allies of their own exotic kind if their unexpected discovery proved to be the turning point that would shatter its integrity. In Dr. Muffet's Island, Asimov's March 2007, said in 1577, Francis Drake had returned to terrestrial exploration, bitterly disappointed by the fact that he was generally thought to be mad because he insisted that the adventure of the ether ship's crew was real rather than illusory, as both Diggs and Field, the only other known survivors, had publicly claimed. Having seen the geography of the globe from space, he hoped to discover new possessions for the English crown in the Pacific, but was disappointed to find that he had been preceded by Humphrey. You should be grateful to me, the impostor said. Had I not given Master Field such a convincing account of your harmlessness, he'd never have bothered to interrogate thee so carefully. I've played you false, though no more false, I think, than you played me in pretending to be a Catholic, but it has worked to your advantage. If not for me, you really might have been taken for a Satanist, rather than a trickster and a fantasist. You should be careful in future about what you pretend to be. The pretense of being a cunning man, a fortune-teller, or a Paracelsian might impress credulous folk, but the word of God is spreading now as never before, and enlightenment will soon reach into every corner of English society. You will fare far better as an honest, God-fearing servant than any kind of mountebank. Thank you for your advice, Brother Cuthbert, Kelly said, deliberately using the false name even though he knew the true one. I am indeed grateful to you, for I know what a narrow escape I've had. I'll certainly be careful in attempting to plan my future. 
By the time this brief conversation had run its course, the first rays of the nascent sun were rising from the eastern horizon, proud and pure in their ambition. "'We cannot walk all day, having had no sleep,' John D. complained. "'We must find a place to rest.' "'Indeed we must,' Giordano Bruno advised. "'Wilton is a long way off, and we must conserve our strength as best we can. "'We have work to do when we arrive.' "'Aye,' said John D. "'There's gold to be made and wisdom to be cultivated.' "'And an army to be gathered,' said the gypsy, "'and a fleet constructed. "'The odds will be against us, but we are forewarned and forearmed.' "'Against our immediate enemies, at least,' Kelly thought, although he said nothing. "'He felt strangely intoxicated.' Yet again, as he made his way on to the muddy road and turned westward, but it was not the effect of angelic possession. This time it was confidence in his destiny, and a knowledge that he had been set apart from common men. For the first time in his life, and in spite of his confusion, he knew that he was a true magician, which might well be a better thing to be than not in the turbulent times that were to come. Light across an impossible lake. Reading time, two minutes. Day breaks over the impossible lake, seven light years long. A newborn may take from her birth to dawning self awareness before the family's down shore friends express joy at seeing sunrise gleam in the east. Dawn at last. They know this glow has increased to shocking morning on that first touched shore. Eyes upon the sky they hope to see more of what Easterners are calling daylight. Straight against the wall, the child has her height marked in pencil. She loves her first day dress. Class starts soon, her parents trained in darkness. Downshore friends will only now be learning how she was born and start school this morning. Light bathes all the lake, and will for ages. Far generations will see the edges of their lake lands turning red with sunset. Such thoughts fail to make those present forget what luck has been theirs. She who learns to play well with others on this beautiful day soon will grow, wed, and some hour die while the sun climbs higher into the sky. Her own child will never see first morning, just day, and on the lake, bright sun burning. Mark Rich. On Books, Paul Di Filippo. Reading Time, 24 Minutes. Introduction. The many worlds of the alternative press continue to flourish and beckon. Let's drop in. Magazines. Small and alternative often means intimate, and that's certainly the case with the latest issue, number 35, of Tailbones. Fairwood Press, Perfect Bound, $7, 99 pages, ISSN, 1084-7197. Editor and publisher Patrick Swenson bravely details in his editorial his marital, business, editorial breakup with his wife Hanna, who was always half of Fairwood and its many enterprises. But he reassures us that the zine will go on under his aegis alone, and if the contents of this issue are any gauge, tailbones will continue to prosper. These accomplished stories run the gamut from pure SF to gothic to near mimetic. Long-established names like William Nolan and Daryl Schweitzer consort with journeyman bylines, and the overall effect is of a pleasant sojourn among people who believe in the magic of storytelling, of whatever stripe. Being present at the birth of a new magazine is always an exciting moment, so bop on over to the Murky Depths website, M-U-R-K-Y-D-E-P-T-H-S dot com, and sign on for an exciting journey. Issue number one, Perfect Bound, 6 pounds 99 pence, 82 pages, ISSN 1752-5586, tidily illustrates the philosophy of editor-publisher Terry Martin which is to blend shortish pieces of dark speculative prose with arresting black-and-white graphics, and also to feature full-blown comics as well. One of the latter such opens the issue, with both script and art, by Richard Calder. Contributors such as John Courtney Grimwood and Levy Tidhar keep the standards high, 
as do the lesser-known names. Slickly and sensitively designed, this is a magazine with a clear vision of how to jazz up our often visually stayed field. Meanwhile, at the opposite end of the longevity spectrum, we check in on Interzone, which is celebrating its 25th anniversary. Under the creative hand of Andy Cox and his co-editors, the flagship of UK periodical SF boasts a fresh-faced, hip, au courant look, matched by fine prose and a reverence for its own roots. Issue number 211, saddle stapled, 3 pounds, 75 pence, 64 pages, ISSN 0264-3596, is something of a special Michael Moorcock tribute, featuring a story, novel excerpt, interview, and a glimpse of the biography of Mervyn Peake that Moorcock releases in 2008. The zine's regular departments, including movie reviews by Nick Lowe and book reviews by John Clute, add further great value to this revered landmark journal. Nonfiction Editor Stephen Hafner has assembled a wonderful tribute volume to the departed Jack Williamson. In memory of Wonder's Child, Jack Williamson, Hafner Press, Trade Paper, $15, 112 pages, ISBN 9-3. An old man named Alberto feels compelled to tell the same mythic story of his youth over and over each day to a 15-year-old boy, to allow the story its opportunity to speak, until the boy becomes a half-complicit bard himself. Alberto's tale concerns Lucia Luna, the village's most beautiful woman and how she danced one night with a dolphin god in human form and became pregnant by the visitor. All communal propriety goes topsy-turvy, and Lucia Luna's life becomes threatened. Only the young Alberto, in love with the older woman, can save her by accosting the dolphin man in his lair. By turns droll, somber, reflective, rueful, and hopeful, this story speaks of eternal verities in very specific mortal masks. Like some devilishly sly hybrid of Howard Hendricks, John Brunner, Norman Spinrad, and Lance Olson, David Memmott spins a metaphysical post-cyberpunk novel in prime time. Wordcraft of Oregon, trade paper, $15, 271 pages, ISBN 978-1-8776555-53-1. The first volume in a new trilogy to be. Mehmet is intent on examining deep epistemological and ontological issues concerning the way humanity fashions its own reality, but he embeds his questions in a captivating thriller. He marshals his extensive cast of characters with precision and brevity of introduction, giving just enough of their backstories to firmly embed the players in our perceptions, and then weaves their life paths together in a glorious tangle. From corporate boardrooms to gang warrens, he lays out a tangible future world. Mehmet's mid-21st century globe is swept up in dream time, a virtual reality of surpassing heft, but lurking in the wings is prime time, an upgrade that offers vital enhancements to dream time, but certain anomalies seeped into the virtual worlds with alarming regularity. With juicy neologisms and racing subplots, Mehmet ponders the big issues raised by his new technology. As one character opines, What is personal identity? Where are the boundaries? Are we the membranes through which information flows? Are we the synapses that fire in response to stimulus? Are we mindless hosts of selfish genes? Are we colonies whose every action is the result of some consensus among individual members? Prime time is the door into what Alfred Whitehead called unbounded potential for creative advance, the moving boundary of co-creation. This is Philosophic SF at its best. SF Conventional Calendar Reading Time, 9 Minutes This is crunch time for deciding which Memorial Day convention is the one that's right for your interests. Plan now for social weekends with your favorite SF authors, editors, artists, and fellow fans. For an explanation of conventions, a sample of SF folk songs, and info on fanzines and clubs, Send me an SASE, self-addressed, stamped, number 10 business envelope, at 10 Hill, number 22L, Newark, New Jersey, 07102. The hotline is 973-242-5999. If a machine answers, with a list of the week's cons, 
leave a message, and I'll call back on my nickel. When writing cons, send an SASE. For free listings, older crowd than most media cons. 23 to 26, Miss Con, 406-544-7093, MISCON.org. Ruby's Inn, Missoula, Montana, General SF and Fantasy Convention. 23 to 26, Timegate, TimegateCON.org. Holiday Inn, Chambly, Dunwoody Road, Atlanta, Georgia, Doctor Who and Stargate. 30 to June 1, Con Carolinas, Box 9100, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28299. C-O-N-C-A-R-O-L-I-N-A-S dot org. Mike Resnick, Kim Harrison, F. Hunter. 30 to June 1. A-Con, 3352 Broadway Boulevard, number 470, Garland, Texas, 75043. A-K-O-N.com. Dallas, Texas. Anime, comics, and more. 30 to June 1. Relaxicon, A-R-I-S-I-A dot org, Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Meet and greet for volunteers for next year's big Aresiacon. 30 to June 2, New Zealand National Con, care of Box 16150, Wellington South, New Zealand. sf.org.nz, somewhere in New Zealand. June 2008. 6 to 8, SoonerCon, 6006 Southwestern, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, 73139, 405-632-2848, S-O-O-N-E-R-C-O-N.com, S-F, Fantasy and Gaming. 6 to 8, ConComCon, care of Box 1066, Seattle, Washington, 98111. SWOC.org forward slash CCUBED. Northwest Con organizers meet to talk shop. 6 to 8, Australia National Con. Care of Box 1212. Melbourne, VIC 3001, Australia. NATCON.org.au. Somewhere in Australia. 6 to 8, Colonia Con. C-O-L-O-N-I-A-C-O-N-2006.de Köln, Cologne, Germany A major media-oriented German convention August 2008, 6-10, Denvention 3, Box 1349, Denver, Colorado 80201 D-E-N-V-E-N-T-I-O-N-3.org Buhold, Sternbach, Whitmore Worldcon, $200. August 2009. 6-10, Anticipation, CP-105, Montreal, Quebec, H4A, 3P4. Anticipation, SF.ca. Gaiman, Hartwell, Doherty. Worldcon, $150 plus U.S. dollars. Next issue. Reading time. Three minutes. August issue. One of science fiction's greatest hidden treasures, Neil Barrett Jr., returns with the lead story of our August issue. In Radio Station St. Jack, Barrett directs his sights, as in many of his best stories, to yet another post-apocalypse, one in which Father Mac must somehow protect his radio station, his faithful flock, and the nun he loves, from Bob the Destroyer's rampaging raiders and hopefully preserve his own tender posterior in the process. This is a wild and witty tale of a down-to-earth padre just trying to keep it together after the rest of the world's fallen apart. We think you'll love it. Also in August, acclaimed new writer Ted Kosmatka returns with a new hard SF story about a laboratory experiment, once thought harmless, that just might rip the world apart under its divining light. Carol M. Schwiller aims right for the heartstrings with her tragic tale of an innocent stranger in our strange land who goes by the name of either Wilmer or Wesley. Robert Reed warns that the local senior citizens you see harmlessly feeding pigeons in the park might not be what they seem in Old Man Waiting. Matthew Johnson presents a timely and uncomfortable portrait of the outsourcing woes of the future in Lagos. 
Jack Skillingstead demonstrates that what you are about to see might just be the result of an unseen alien agenda, and J. Chris Rock, making a strong Asimov's debut, describes the perilous journey of Lucy along the murky seas of Saturn's moon Titan. Our exciting features. Rudy Rucker contributes a new Thought Experiments column that forecasts no less than the strange shape of future humanity after the Great Awakening. Robert Silverberg calls upon over 50 years of experience to present some thoughts on the short story in his Reflections column. James Patrick Kelly goes back to school with the intention of storming the Academy in On the Net. Peter Heck presents On Books, plus an array of pleasant poetry by many of your favorite poets. Coming soon. New stories by Nancy Cress, William Barton, Melanie Tem, and Steve Resnick Tem, Ian R. McLeod, Stephen Baxter, Mary Rosenblum, Larry Niven, Jeffrey A. Landis, Robert Reed, Ian Creasy, Jack Skillingstead, Robert R. Chase, Will McIntosh, Stephen Utley, and many others. End of Asimov's Science Fiction for July 2008 Recorded in the studios of Potomac Talking Book Services Incorporated for the Library of Congress, June 2008 Published by Dell Magazines, a division of Crosstown Publications, 6 Prowett Street, Norwalk, Connecticut, 06855. Further reproduction or distribution in other than a specialized format is prohibited. If you experienced any difficulty with your copy of this magazine, please specify the problem on a postcard or a letter addressed to Materials Development Division, National Library Service for the Blind and Physically Handicapped, Washington, D.C., 20542 or send an email message to qas at loc.gov. End of book.